for this awesome church. Oh, wow. We had a first time, we had first service, we had an awesome time, and I'm, I'm just praying, oh, God, that message just seemed to flow in that first service, Pastor Lane, <laughs> and I'm saying, oh, God, help us in this service. All right, we're going to be talking about prayer and the prayers of Jesus. We're studying the Gospel of Luke. Remember, the Gospel of Mark is primarily for the Romans. Mark, he connected with the Roman world because he was living in Rome, even as Paul and Peter were getting ready to die, he was ministering, and he's ministering to the Roman world, and he presents Christ as the servant. Now, Luke is the physician, physician who wrote 28% of the New Testament, along with the Apostle Paul, writing another 28%. They were great buddies. They traveled together. And Luke is emphasizing to the Greek world the humanity of Jesus Christ. Now, one thing I, I really can't comprehend or understand is how Jesus is entirely, completely all God. All God. And the Word became flesh. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is totally, completely, entirely, absolutely God. He is the Son of God. He is God in the flesh. But at the same time, He is totally, completely, entirely all human. He had to sleep like we slept. Like we sleep, he had to eat like we eat. He had to go to places. He had to hurt like he, he had a body just like we have. And I can't comprehend that, but that's the New Testament. Now, Jesus being God, but also being all human, we find in the Gospel of Luke was a person who prayed. And when you study the Gospel of Luke, and we started on this last week, and we mentioned the prayers of Jesus in the Gospel of of Luke. And that's what we're going to look at today is how Jesus was a person of prayer. He prayed. Now, I grew up with a praying dad and a praying mother. I said on one of the chats this week that, um, I, of course, I miss my parents. My mother passed away two years ago this month. And, uh, and if there's one thing I miss about my mother, of course, her love, her care, her friendship, and her everything for us, I miss her prayers because she was a woman of prayer. She prayed, and she prayed every day for me. My dad was a person of prayer. As I grew up, my dad prayed, and I heard him pray. As a kid growing up, we, we moved. I, well, I went to 13 different schools by the time I got to 12th grade. You know what that means? We moved a lot, a lot. And so if I ever wanted to know what our family was going to be doing next, all I had to do was get up about 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning because my dad got up very, very early, and he would go into a room in the house, and he would pray. My, my dad thought God was deaf. He really did. So he prayed really loud. I mean, like, really loud. And you could hear him for blocks away almost. He prayed, and he prayed all the time. And he communed with God. And I had an example of my dad praying. I... Uh, I'll never forget, my dad was so serious about prayer. If you got a glass of water at my house and started to drink it, and my dad saw that, he might ask you, did you pray for that glass of water? You know, and you're going, oh, sure, okay. One time my sister was getting ready just to eat a snack, and my dad stopped her, Janet, and he said, have you prayed for that before you ate? Because she was eating. And she said, yes, I prayed. I prayed to myself. And I'll never forget as serious as can be, he looked at her and he said, don't you ever pray to yourself. You pray to God. <laughs> oh, man, I just can't. I got that picture in my mind. I can see that kitchen when he did that. I mean, my dad set an example for prayer. Probably the person who's wrote the most books about prayer in recent years is Dr. Elmer Towns. Numerous books. The first day I began doing pastor chats on prayer this week, I got a package in the mail, I tore it open, and guess what that book was? It was, a, it was, a, what was in the package was a book from Dr. Elmer Towns. Dr. Towns, his personal assistant for the last almost 30 years, is my sister-in-law, so that kind of gives me the inside, but it also goes back to the fact that he taught me all my theology the first years, and he's been a friend and a mentor and somebody who's come here to Rainbow and shared with us over the years. So I always get his books even before they get released to the public, and so I get this package, open it up, and I almost knew what it was. Almost, I just said, I bet it's another book from Dr. Towns. It seems like he writes a book every other week, and so I opened the package, and it was a book, and I'm just now doing my first chat on praying 
and open this book. And guess what the title of this book is? Praying with Jesus. Praying with Jesus. And as we look at the Gospel of Luke, there's no other gospel in the New Testament. Or place in the New Testament, it seems like as Luke is emphasizing the humanity of Jesus, he talks about the prayers of Jesus specifically over and over again. And so that's what we're going to look at today as we look at the book of Luke, the prayers of Jesus, praying with Jesus. So I'm very excited about this message, as you can tell, and uh, I'm just uh, really praying God will use this to help us become people of prayer. Now, I almost forgot something in my introduction from the last service. This week is very important because on October 13th, Tuesday is the last day to register to vote register to vote. I'm convinced we're at a crossroads in America. I'm convinced this could be one of the most crucial, crucial elections in the history of my lifetime, maybe the history of our nation. The outcome of this election could determine the course of our nation, maybe the ultimate dismay, dismay of our nation for years and years to come. It's so vitally important that you get registered to vote and that you vote correctly, truthfully, honestly. And if you have a problem with knowing exactly who to vote for, I'll help you. <laughs> Let me help you just very briefly. I vote for people that are anti-abortion. Life is of tremendous value to God and life in the womb is very precious. I just can't comprehend how we want to protect spotted owl eggs and turkey eggs, but we kill babies in the womb. It just boggles my mind, and then say we care about people. That's a, that's a double talk. That's a lie. So I don't vote for people that are pro-abortion. I'm for the family. One man, one woman for life. Now, sometimes there's divorce and there's remarriage. But I'm still believing God ordained the home. God ordained the family. I'm for the family. I'm not for all this other craziness that's going on that they call family today. I'm for people who stand for the family. I'm for people who stand for what the believers and the heritage of our country is for. I love America, and I'm going to vote for people that love this country and have this country's heart and interest. It doesn't mean those people are perfect when I vote for them or I agree with them and the way they do things, but I'm still going to vote for them versus those who are against what this country stands for and the Christian heritage we have. So I'm telling you, if you're not registered to vote, October 13th this week is important to get registered to vote. And then make sure you prayerfully vote truthfully based on biblical perspective and biblical convictions. Do I hear amen? Amen. amen. I make no apology for that. Now, that I've said that, I want you to also hear this. As important it is for you to vote, it pales to the importance of you praying. The Bible does not say, if my people go to the vote, polls and vote, I will heal your land. But the Bible does say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, repent, turn from their sin, turn from their wicked ways, I'll hear from heaven. Now I can tell you this, I don't know what the outcome of the election is going to be. If you listen to the fake media, you might already say our side is lost, if there's such a thing as our side. But I'm telling you, I'm not super concerned about the outcome. I'm going to do my best to make sure it's as good as it can be. But I'm going to tell you this. That's my responsibility. I'm not super concerned about it because I got a God who sits on the throne. And if, quote, the other side wins, that's okay because my God still sits on the throne. And God knows what this country deserves and what we need. And it could be the best thing that ever happened to this country. If the liberals, the abortionists, and the America haters take over, it might wake some Christians up. And we need to be woken up. So, I'm happy. 
and I'm at peace. But I want to tell you this. There's nothing more important you can do for your own life, for the sake of your children and your grandchildren, for generations to come, than to pray. And we're going to look at the prayers of Jesus and hopefully encourage you today to pray. And having done all, pray. Amen? Amen. Okay, let's go. All right. We got, uh, uh, got 10 minutes left here to do this. Let's say our verse together, okay? All together. This is our verse for the year because this is what it's all about. Psalm 96, 2 to 4 and 8. Sing to the Lord. Bless his name. Proclaim the good news of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his wonders among all peoples. For the Lord is great and greatly to be praised. He's to be feared above all gods. Give to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Bring an offering. Amen. And, of course, we're connecting the disconnected to Christ community call. And we're glorify God, hopefully, in everything we say and do. So I have two titles today. One taken right from Luke chapter 11, verse 1, where the disciple says, Lord, teach us to pray. A second title from Dr. Town's book, Praying with Jesus. With Christ in the School of Prayer, Andrew Murray had a book with that title. So let's stand together, and we're going to read from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 13. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. Now, what's kind of caught my attention, just, just the first word, now, 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 now. I want you to do it now, 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 now is the day. Now, present tense, now, Jesus is praying. Jesus not only gave us an example to suffer, okay, First Peter said, Following Jesus as our example, he gives us an example, especially in the Gospel of Luke, on how to pray and what to pray and how to engage in prayer. But one of the things you're going to find out is Jesus was prayer itself. Jesus was prayer. Now Jesus was praying. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, as I said in the pastor's chat, that prayer is not so much taught as it is caught. You get around to pray in person, there's something about it that motivates you and brings you into the presence of God and gives you a deep heart desire to connect with the God of the universe who created you. Teach us to pray. And he said, he responded, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who's indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, and he gives an example, Which of you has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey. I have nothing to set before him. And he'll answer from within, Don't bother me. The door is shut. My children are with me in bed. These were one-room homes back then. The bed was in the corner. I cannot get up and give you anything. And Jesus said, I tell you. And you might want to underline that, right, Pastor Lane? Because you see this in chapter 18 two times, too, on prayer. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, that's a crazy, I'm not sure about that word, impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. It's like he says it twice. And then he gives another example. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, 
And will instead of a fish, he give him a snake, a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? And then he's contrasting this. So if you, you're being evil, and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Wow. How much more will your heavenly Father in the Gospel of Luke, he says, actually give good things to those who ask him. Father, in these next moments, Lord, as crucial as it is for us to be involved in our government as good citizens, as Christians, as believers, Lord, it's more crucial for us to pray. So today, stir up our hearts for prayer, to pray, to learn to pray, to pray without ceasing, to engage in prayer, to practice praying. To pray with Jesus. To pray as Jesus prayed. To pray biblical prayers. So Lord, only you can do that, I know, today in the hearts of your people. And you will do it because I'm asking, as my heavenly Father, today give the Holy Spirit to this church, to this people, to teach us to pray. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen. Now, you can be seated. The fact that Jesus had to pray as God while he was ministering here on earth is proof enough that we need to pray. Just look at the times Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed at his baptism, Luke 3, 21 and 22. He's beginning his ministry. Now, when all the people were baptized, when Jesus also had been baptized, and Luke points out and was praying. So as Jesus getting baptized, guess what he's doing? He was praying. The heavens opened. The Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I'm well pleased. First time in New Testament, God speaks out of heaven, so to speak, is when Jesus became a Baptist. God got excited. Now you say, what? I told Kathy Shell, I said, today you became a Baptist. What does that mean? That means you joined? No, it doesn't mean. It means you came to a Baptist church? No, it doesn't mean that. It means that you have followed the Lord in believer's baptism. You got in a baptistry, you got dunked all the way under a river or someplace, and you came up again. That's what John the, what's he called? John the Baptist. Okay, why? He was John the Baptizer. He put people in water. He brought them back up. Baptism by immersion. After salvation, you get baptized, you became a Baptist. Whether you go to the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, whatever church you go to, when you got baptized, you became a baptized believer. You became a Baptist. Okay, and get, God gets happy. Now, Jesus prayed before he chose the 12, Luke 6, 12. In these days, he went out to the mountain to pray. And notice, look at this. And all night, he continued in prayer to God. All night he prayed. Jesus prayed at the transfiguration. After eight days, after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James. They went up to the mountain to what? To see God? To see the glory of God? No, they went up there to what? Pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. Oswald Chambers, I love the quote, it's not so much that prayer changes things, but prayer changes you, and you change things. As Jesus is praying, the whole countenance begins to glow with the glory and the presence of God, and it's obvious that God is there. And I'm telling you, when you really pray and you're in the presence of God, people will take notice of it. Jesus prayed before he was arrested, Luke 22. And again, I just point out and notice and watch this over and over again. As he drew, withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Now there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he gave up. No, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from the ground, no, he rose from prayer, 
he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping with sorrow. Remember what he told them in the Gospel of Matthew? He told them, hey, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He is even trying to teach them to pray if this Christ is our. Jesus prayed on the cross in Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Jesus prayed at other times in Luke 5, verse 16. But he would withdraw to desolate places and pray. He would go to where nobody was, desolate places, where he could be alone. and Nobody knew. Jesus had said, remember, when you pray, enter into the closet and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. Desolate places, that secret place of prayer. Nobody hears your prayers. Nobody knows you're praying, but God knows you're praying. And you pray to the Father in secret. You shut the door. Does that mean you go into the closet in the house and you're, you know, what, no, I don't think it means that. But it means that you go to the certain place that God's called you to pray. You shut the door to all the distractions. You concentrate on the fact that you have an audience with the creator of the universe. And you talk to the Father in secret. And he will see you in secret. And the Bible says he will reward you. How? Openly. Openly. Luke 9, 18. Now it happened as he was praying alone. His disciples were with him. And that's interesting. He was praying alone. (laughs) Do you get that? Do you ever read stuff like that and you go, okay, let me figure this out. He was praying alone and his disciples were with him. Hey, Luke, what are you if he's, he's not alone if his disciples are with him. You know what that means? His disciples were with him, but he was in prayer. Even while they're with him and he was alone. He and his father were communicating, even with people around him. Isn't that awesome? And he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? The, dis- the 12 disciples obviously learned the importance of prayer. Read their epistles later. Jesus prayed so many different ways in so many different Many bodily positions. He knelt. He stood. He lifted his hands. He laid prostrate on the ground. Jesus expressed his prayer in so many different ways. He prayed silently. He prayed out loud. He prayed alone by himself. He prayed with other people. Jesus prayed for individuals. He prayed for groups. He prayed for those who he had never seen. He prayed for himself. Jesus prayed spontaneously when the need arose. He prayed when the heart overflowed with praise as his father did a miracle for him as in John chapter 11 when Lazarus came out of the grave Jesus said thank you father that you have heard me Woo! and answered these people that they might see your glory oh isn't that exciting smile at me okay Jesus gave a pattern of prayer for his disciples to pray but more than that Jesus left us an example of a praying life Jesus didn't invent prayer. He really didn't introduce any new techniques of prayer. No, Jesus just prayed. Throughout the Old Testament, people prayed. Just read the Old Testament. And when Jesus became flesh, human, and identified with us, he prayed. In Genesis 4.26, one of the first things that happens with the human race. Seth had a son who was born, he called his name Enos. At that time, at that time, and look at this, at that time, very first chapters of the book of Genesis, at that time, people began to call on the name of God. Why? Why? God created humans, and they needed to reach out to their creator, and they did it with prayer. Prayer is the connection of a human being, of us, the creation, with the creator God, Prayer allows us and gives us what we need to get into his presence. What is the nature of prayer? The word nature means the power and the energy that makes the act of prayer what it is. When you say energy, you're looking for its source of power. And when you examine energy and power, you're basically examining life itself. Life itself. Praying is life. It's real life. In a very fictitious way world that's around us to pray is to live it's to really live the nature of prayer so many things it's relationship prayers 
conversion. Prayer's entrance into God's presence. Prayer's focusing on God. Prayer demands your total personal response. Prayer is life changing. Prayer is a necessary mandate in the Bible. And when you study the Gospel of Luke, as we've already said, you find Jesus prayed in different ways, in different times, in different places for all different topics. And Jesus, of course, he never forgot anything because he's Jesus, okay? But Jesus never forgot to pray as you study his life. Jesus began his ministry with prayer at his baptism as Jesus was praying. So he's getting ready to start his three and a half years of earthly ministry, dealing with the devil, dealing with the crowds, dealing with healing and miracles and messages and parables. And what does he do? He's getting baptized and he's praying. What is Jesus doing today? Wow, look at Hebrews 7.25. Therefore, he is always able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for us. You know what Jesus is doing right now? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father. He's our advocate, and he's praying. He's praying for me as I bring this message to you. He's praying for you, for your heart to be open. He prayed for Peter. I pray that Satan, who wants to sift you as wheat, I have prayed for you that you do not fail. And when you are brought back into communion and fellowship with me, strengthen the brethren, Jesus told Peter. Oh, wow. In Luke 11, the disciples asked the Lord to teach them to pray. And Jesus responds with several things. Jesus gives them the pattern for prayer. We call that the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. That's not the Lord. We call it the Lord's Prayer, but really that's not the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John chapter 17. That's when he prayed for the disciples. He prayed for us. He prayed for the world. John 17. But this is the pattern for prayer. The pattern for prayer. And then Jesus taught them the persistence of prayer. I'm going pretty quick through this. I hope you'll go back and study. But the persistence of prayer. He said, so what if you you have a friend that comes to you at midnight and says, hey, I need some bread for my friend. And so it's like, so a friend, he said, you have a friend who has a friend who has a friend. Like, okay, I'll try to figure this out. But you're asleep in bed, and you have a friend that comes to you and says, "I, I, I need some bread. It's midnight. And you know what? I think there's so much in this parable. This is a parable. It's teaching this lesson. But it's a parable that's basically saying it's midnight for a lot of people out there. It's the last hour. It's the last minutes. They're getting ready to go into eternity. It's their last time to have hope in the life and in the world. It's midnight, and they need the bread of life. They need Jesus. And you go to the friend, you wake him up at midnight and say, give me some bread. But the friend says, I'm asleep, I'm in bed. I'm, 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 what are you trying to do? My kids are sleeping. I'm not going to wake up and crawl over them to go get you some bread. And then he says, I'm going to tell you, even though he don't get up because he's his friend, relationship, because of his importunity is the way the old King James puts it, because of his persistence, After he says, I'm not leaving till you give me some bread for my friend. We have 250 plus names in this box. We have friends who need the bread of life. And they didn't get saved the first prayer you prayed for them. But I'm going to tell you, God's going to hear your prayer if you don't give up. Because sometimes, did you read all those chambers this morning? The silence of God. The silence of God. Can God trust you with his silence where he doesn't give you an answer immediately or answer the prayer immediately? So don't give up. Jesus is teaching the persistence of prayer. The persistence. Don't quit praying for the same thing over and over if necessary. Week after week, year after year after year. George Mueller is one of the greatest human examples who is not God. George Mueller who started in orphanages for little kids in London, England, and he determined he was never going to ask a person for a penny to take care of these orphans. He would only ask God. And then he would journal his prayers and show the world that he has a God who is still a God who answers prayer. You ought to read the journals of George Mueller journaling God answering his prayers. George Mueller will tell about praying for some people. Many of them got saved just before he passed away, One of them didn't get saved in his lifetime, but got saved after he passed away. 
Don't ever give up on your prayer. The persistence of prayer. Jesus is teaching that. Jesus is encouraging them with the promised rewards of prayer. And don't you like this? Asking it'll be given to you. Seeking you'll find. Knocking it'll be open to you. Everyone. Then he says it again. For everyone. Everyone. You, me, anyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it shall be open. Then Jesus reveals to them the secret to the real power of prayer. If you are evil and you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You say, what does that have to do with the power of prayer? Well, just before his ascension, he told his disciples, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Have you ever asked the Father for the Holy Spirit? The anointing of the Spirit, the presence of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of prayer. The Bible says He prays. He makes intercessions through you. He knows the mind and the will of God, Romans chapter 8. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Holy Spirit is the one who takes your focus and glorifies Jesus Christ in all he says and does. The Holy Spirit is so crucial to understanding what prayer is all about. And he says, don't you know your heavenly Father is ready to give you the Holy Spirit to help you to be the prayer warrior the prayer person you ought to be. Amen. Man, God help us. Thank you, Jesus, so much. We're not done yet. Give me a couple more minutes. In Luke 18, the Lord gives his disciples some practical applications of prayer. Actually, when I was working on this message earlier in the week, I told the staff where I'd be preaching on Luke 18. But for some reason, preaching on prayer, I had to combine Luke 11 and 18. Because in 18, it's like the Lord's given us some practical applications of prayer. And he uses two parables. The parable of the widow, the adversary, and the unjust judge. And then the parable of two men who go to the temple to pray. Now, a parable, when Jesus says, and he spoke to them in a parable, the parable is a earthly story with heavenly meaning. Okay, heavenly meaning. It's an outward symbol of an inward reality. So a parable, God is trying to make a point that's a spiritual point, but he tells an earthly story to make that point. Now, when you look at the context of chapter 18 of Luke, you've got to go back to 17 to see how it kind of sets up. In chapter 17, the disciples have asked the question, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord goes through the chapter. Toward the end of the chapter, he talks about desperate times, the conditions that will prevail at the end of this age. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days when the Son of Man comes back. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be. What was those days? It was days when people were vile and wicked and ungodly. They were marrying, they were given in marriage, and they were living as if there was no God. The conditions were dark and dreary, and there seemed like nothing good was going to happen. And God was bringing a message of judgment, a message of judgment. If you don't repent, judgment's coming. Noah preached for hundreds of years. Get ready, a flood is coming. It's just like today. That's what it's like. It's like today in our country, in our world where people don't want the message of Jesus Christ. They don't want Christians telling them how to live their lives. They don't want God in their lives or in their community. Now, they want all the benefits that come with having a God and a Christian faith, but they don't want the God of that Christian faith. Very obvious. It's dark and dreary, as it was in those days. But basically what he's saying, it's not the amount of faith that you have, It's the faith that you live out on a regular, daily basis. Daily, regular basis. And so God help us today to live out our faith as we pray. In Luke 18, 18, in verse 8, after Jesus tells the first parable, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Now, what, what what do you think he means by that? So he tells this parable about men praying, the widow, the judge, the adversary, and he tells the parable. And then he says, will he find faith? What do you think he means? He's not talking about the amount of your faith. He's talking about will he find you faithful in praying? Will he find you faithful in serving? 
Will he find you faithful in giving? Will he find you faithful in sharing your faith? Because you can't be faithful without faith. And faith that is real faith will cause you to be faithful. Faithful to your God. Faithful to truth. Faithful to continuing living out your Christian experience, your Christian faith. And so he says, will he find faith? Now, go back to the parable, and you put it in context. Men ought always to pray and not to faint or lose heart and quit. In other words, what will keep you from quitting? Quitting. What will keep you faithful in Bible reading, witnessing, church attendance, Christian service, being a deacon, serving as a teacher and in ministry? What will keep you in the attitude and the spirit of prayer in your life? And Jesus said, pray and will. Keeping your focus and your understanding of your source of energy and life that comes from a connection with God through prayer. It's interesting to note that the physician Luke is a people person. In this chapter 18, as you go through it, there is a widow, there's an unjust politician, there's a Pharisee, there's a tax collector, there's a bad sinner, there's little children, there's adults, there's rich man. And the book, the chapter ends with a story about a beggar coming to Jesus. Luke's interested in people, everyone, no matter what your status is, your background is. God is interested in you being a part of his team in prayer. Now, several things from these parables, these two parables, real quick, and we close. Number one, I need to realize that prayer is a great privilege, a wonderful privilege, that I, a create, created being, can talk to the creator of the heavens and the earth. Now, honestly, I'm so human if President Trump sent a message and says, um, and maybe called me personally and said, hey, would you come up to the White House? I just need to chat with you for a few hours about some things. You'd probably hear about it, you know. If President Obama, much as I disagreed with him on a lot of things, if he would have called me and asked me, I'll guarantee you I would have said sure. And I'd love to talk about the fact I've met him personally and had the opportunity to talk to him. And I'd want to hear what he had to say, but I'd have a few things to say to him too. If President Bush would have called, I would have been happy. And I would have been very, like, matter of fact, I was in a meeting where I actually had the prayer before President Johnson. Remember President Johnson? I was alive back then, believe it or not. And I had a meeting that I was invited to where I was introduced like I was the king of England. And they introduced Edith and I, and we walked in this big banquet hall like we were, like king and queen. And I sat on the platform next to President Johnson, and I did the invocation and the prayer before he gave his little speech. My prayer was a whole lot better than his speech. <laughs> and don't you know, I still have that brochure that tells about that. I'm proud of that. Now, I'm telling you this. I'm telling you this. That pales in comparison to the privilege I have any place, any time, anywhere. To say, my Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I tell you, I do, by the grace of God, I wake up praying. And I say, God, I need your help to get out of this bed. And I sit on the side of the bed and I said, Lord, that's amazing. I'm not alive still. I'm breathing. I can stand up. I walk out the door. The first thing. Words that come out of my mouth when I walk out the door of my house or anywhere I live or I'm staying. Always, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So I've been living across the street in the missions house over here. And I walk up to my office this past week. Man, every morning the stars and the moon. Man, it was just bright. Oh, everything. And wasn't it so clear this week? And I looked. I says, oh, God, when I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, Oh, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visited him. Man, I have the privilege. Whew. That's better than talking to the president, I can tell you. And you have that privilege. Now, it's important that I understand the privilege that it is. Now, this story of the widow and this judge, this unjust judge, back in those days, a judge like this 
he was like a circuit court judge, circuit court. So he had a circuit, okay? He would take his tent, he would go over here and set it up, and the people in that little community or village, they would come, and, and they could go before the judge and say, I've got a problem, somebody's trying to steal my property, somebody's doing this, and the judge would make judgments. But the problem with this judge was he was an unjust judge. If you were wealthy and rich and famous and you had some money and you could bribe him, he would give judgment on your behalf. But if you was a poor person like this widow, you couldn't even get there to get a hearing by this unjust judge because he is an unjust judge. But this widow, read the story, they said, get out of here. He don't want to listen to you. You don't have any money. You're a widow. You're destitute. You, you have, get out. She was a widow. She's alone. She has no help. She's hopeless. And he, so to speak, kicks her out of his court. But she comes back. And she comes back. And she comes back. And she comes back. And finally, finally, this judge says, goodness, this woman is, <laughs> some of you husbands, this woman's going to drive me crazy if I don't give her what she wants. <laughs> Ladies, don't you get mad at me. But that's what he says. Just read the text. And so he says, what do you want? And she says, I have an adversary. Will you avenge me of my adversary? And the Bible says he avenges her of the adversary. He takes care of the problem for her, even though he's an unjust judge. And then he's making the point, how much more will your heavenly father avenge you of your adversary when you cry unto him day and night? Amen. Do you get the point there? The privilege you have, even though you're destitute, even though you don't feel like Nobody cares. You have a God in heaven who will care and help you. See, our access, our act, this lady had no access. We have access to the Father. And the access to the Father we have is always in the name of Jesus Christ. I don't get to say, God, will you answer my prayer? Oh, I have been so good lately. Man, best I know, I hadn't said a cuss word in a week. I haven't uh, really been mad at anybody. I, I've, I've really been nice to the children, even when they didn't deserve it. I was kind to my husband or my wife. I was, forget it. The only way you have entrance into the Father is through the blood of Jesus Christ. Did I say it in this service or the last service already? Did I say when I pray I have the S's that I have to come into the presence of the Father with? Was that in this service or the last service? Last service? Yeah, I got these S's. Lord, I am so sinful. I am so selfish. I am so slothful. I am so sensual. I am a rotten, good-for-nothing mess, Father. But I am so thankful that I have Jesus Christ who washes me and cleanses me and gives me access to your ear. Amen? So we have access. Okay. I must know that prayer is an absolutely a necessi necessary. She had, a wit she had an adversary. We have an adversary, the devil. We're no match for the devil, folks. You're no match for the devil. Even Michael wouldn't contend with him. He said, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Men ought always to pray and not to faint. Why? The devil's doing everything he can to discourage you and cause you to quit. We are so dependent upon God and upon his Holy Spirit to give us strength for the day. I need to realize that prayer is urgent. It's urgent. I'm not begging God. This is a story of contrast. The wicked friends of the unjust judge, they don't seem to face any judgment. This poor widow couldn't get a hearing. But the conditions are terrible, as we said in the last chapter. But now, everything seems to be against us in the Christian life. And we cry out to God, avenge me of my adversary. And I'm telling you, that's a prayer I pray every day for every one of my family members, my daughter-in-laws, my son-in-law. I pray for my grandchildren and all my surrounded friends. I pray, avenge me of the adversary in their lives. Our prayer must be void of self-confidence. We learn in the second parable, the Pharisee, he had no sense of need. He compared himself to everybody else, and he was better. I'm better than this sinner publican over here. I tithe. I go to church. I read my Bible. I pray. Oh, I am so good, God, you have to hear me. You see, our first love basically simply means I have total dependence upon 
God for everything I need in my life. And by the way, I don't care how good a Christian you are, you're still totally dependent upon God to make it through another day. Totally dependent upon God. Some people think losing their first love means they lost the feeling that they had when they first got saved. And I, I, I'll never forget those feelings. They were fantastic feelings. My sins are gone. I'm forgiven. And God just seemed like he was right there. I can tell you, I wake up a lot of days and God doesn't seem very close. I feel like that one preacher evangelist says most of us wake up and we don't say, good morning, Lord. We say, good Lord, morning. <laughs> you know, but what do we do? We pray anyway. Because it's not based on feelings, it's based on faith and our total dependence upon God. Our prayer has to be honest. The tax collector, the publican, the sinner, he beat upon his breast and on his heart and he says, oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See, the important thing about prayer is not the words or the mode of words or the number of words, but it's the heart, humble, honest, poor in spirit. Our prayers must be honest. Tell God exactly how we feel. We must believe that our prayers will be answered. And I love this, Luke 18, 8a, I tell you. Remember back in chapter 11? I tell you. <laughs> I love this. Jesus says, he gets you, he shakes you. Did you ever do this with a kid? I tell you, you better listen to me. I tell you, hey, that comes from Jesus. I tell you, I tell you. And what is he telling you? Do I have your attention? He's telling you, God will answer your prayer. That's what he's telling you. Look what he says. I tell you, he'll give justice to them speedily. I tell you, this man went home justified rather than the other. The prayer of the widow, the prayer of the honest, sin-conscious publican, they were prevailing prayers. And then he ends this portion of Scripture on prayer. Look what he ends it. He says in Luke 18, 15, and they were bringing him, even infants to him and children that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked him. But Jesus said to him, hey, 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 let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter into it. So the question this morning, are you praying? Because if you're not praying, you're quitting, you're straying. And then he says, pray like a child. Pray like a child. Do you know how a child prays? They pray genuinely, sincerely, and honestly, and they pray believing. When they tell God, I, they're shocked God doesn't answer their prayer. Yeah? And he said, that's the way you have to come. Let's pray. Father, I pray, Holy Spirit of the living God, that you'll speak to us today as we think about the importance and the power and the place of prayer and a life of prayer like Jesus, praying without ceasing, communing with God, becoming actually, as Oswald Chambers would say, it's not that we seek to know the will of God. We become the will of God as we enjoy his presence through prayer in our lives every day. Praying is the energy, the life of God itself. And I pray, oh God, help us, help us, help us to begin to have a life of prayer. And if you're listening today, it all begins with a relationship with Jesus Christ. Maybe you're listening by live stream or by some video later this week on YouTube or however. But I'm telling you, if you want to be a person who can pray and have your prayers answered and believe that you have a God who answers your prayer, Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except by me because I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Have you ever truly experienced true salvation? Maybe the reason there's no prayer life, there's no communion with God, is you've never had the sin problem taken care of through the blood and the cross of Jesus Christ. Right now, would you say, oh God, I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. I'm convicted of my sin. I feel the burden and weight of my sin. I feel like there's a major obstacle between me and God. And I'm going to tell you what that obstacle is. It's sin. And what sin is, in essence, is pride. It's thinking you can do it without God. It's thinking you can make it without him. That's what pride is. That's what sin is. I, 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 the middle letter of pride, the middle letter of sin. I, 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 without God. And you come and say, I give up the right to myself. Lord, I'm a sinner Forgive me, cleanse me, save me today. Jesus said that man went home justified. That means he went home just like he had never sinned without any guilt, even though he is a terrible, wicked traitor and thief 
He's a tax collector, a publican. The worst of the worst in that day. But Jesus, you saved him. And you declared him to be justified. Today you could be de declared to be justified if you by faith receive Christ. Would you do that right now? Right where you're sitting, ask Jesus to come into your heart. Right where you're listening, at home, in the car, wherever you might be. Pull off to the side of the road if you're driving and get before God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I need salvation. Beat your chest if you have to. And from your heart, say, oh, God, save me today. And my friend, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, I tell you, he will save you. If you're here today and you've strayed and you've not been praying like you should, you're not communing with God, you've lost that prayer time, that prayer devotion, that sense of urgency and importance and the practice The practice of praying right now, would you call on the Lord to forgive you and ask the Holy Spirit to help you to get back to where you should be in your prayer life with God? Praying with Jesus. Praying as Jesus prayed. And that only happens as you get in the Word of God. The Word of God fuels prayer. Bible prayers. This morning on our chat we asked people to email us we got a whole bunch of things about prayer we'd love to email you if you want how to pray for the upcoming elections bible prayers scriptural prayers i'll be glad to send you a copy of these prayers right from the bible to pray you email us this week thank you lord jesus for what you're doing in this place today thank you for everyone here we desperately need you in this country but lord most of all and More importantly, we need you in our lives. We need you in our church. We need you in our witness, the power of the Holy Spirit to be a witness here, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. Lord, thank you for what you're going to do today. In Jesus' name, and God's people say, amen, amen.